from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this Easter weekend. I'm Ty Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Wild weather blankets the U.S. this week. What I have my stomach turning in knots about is the whole next week with below 30 in the low teens. From blizzards to extreme winds, it's taking a toll on wheat and those in the middle of calving season. President Biden clearing the way for summertime E15. You're going to be able to keep filling up with E15, and it's going to solve the whole problem. The impact it could have on prices and demand. And in John's world... Sometimes we get the inflation we expect. Now for the news from blizzard-like conditions with heavy snow, high winds, and bitter cold temperatures to extreme fire danger and severe weather. Much of the nation experiencing some sort of wild weather this week. We start in North Dakota where blizzard conditions brought poor visibility in the roads, but several inches of snow. And while the moisture is welcome news, it's a big concern for ranchers as calving season is still in full swing for some. What I have my stomach turning in knots about is the whole next week with below 30 in the low teens um, for the, this coming weekend too. Um, after these calves get two foot of snow dumped on them and it's heavy, wet snow, and then it stays cold and doesn't warm up at all, you know, it's hard. It's going to be hard to keep them healthy. It's going to be hard to keep things alive, I think. The last time Langley says that they had such severe weather this late would have been the blizzard of 1997. And farmers have battled multiple wind events already this year with the majority of the dry land winter wheat crop across the Panhandle and Southern Plains already zeroed out by crop adjusters. But the wheat under irrigation was still barely hanging on until this week. Jesse Wieners farms in Groom, Texas and hasn't seen rain in more than 140 days. He says high winds and 90 degrees Tuesday were already proving to be a lethal combination for the wheat that was still alive. For, for our farm, there won't be anything harvested dry land wise. Uh, irrigated, we've still got a few circles that we're watering. That's after today, I guess we'll kind of kind of see what what's out there. But I know that we're already starting to get some some dirt blowing from from some uh, some county roads and stuff like that, that we're starting to blow across it and already start to see some some sand burn on that. The Texas farmer says it'll take about a week to know just how much of the crop survived. But as you see images, it looks like the Dust Bowl. And as of Monday, USDA said none of Texas's winter wheat was considered excellent. 79% is already rated poor to very poor. Well, another big story this week, the president announcing Americans will be allowed to keep buying E15 this summer. The president traveling to Menlo, Iowa, making the announcement at a Poet Ethanol plant. To make the change official, the EPA is planning to issue a national emergency waiver closer to June. Americans would be able to then fill their tanks with gas that has a 15 percent ethanol blend through September 15th. The White House saying President Biden is doing it in order to help address the pain at the pump. E15 is about 10 cents a gallon cheaper than E10. And some gas stations offer an even bigger discount than that. But many of the gas stations that sell it here in Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania are required to stop selling in the summer. But with this waiver, on June 1, you're not going to show up at your local gas station and see a bag over the pump that has the cheapest gas. You're going to be able to keep filling up with E15 and it's going to solve the whole problem. The White House says the EPA is also considering additional actions that would allow for the use of E15 year round. Well, the Labor Department is putting a number on inflation. In March, the consumer price index showing prices rose 8.5 percent. That's the highest increase since December of 1981. Food prices are up nearly 9 percent since the same month last year. Now that was led by bacon up more than 18%. Beef is now up 16% with milk and chicken prices climbing more than 13%. In China this week making another big grain buy, USDA announcing a sale of 1,020,000 metric tons of corn. Bill Biederman of agmarket.net saying it's a fairly significant sale because it's a follow-up from last week's big buy that was also more than a million metric tons of corn and the first time they've been back in the market since May. 
And there was a lot of traders in the meantime who started to say, you know, they're not going to buy as much corn. They're, they're, they're done in the marketplace. They're going to use their reserves uh, and they're going to have a big crop coming. Of course, that's all on paper. But the point being is they are back. They are buying. And, and to us, that's a really big thing. USDA has been lowering their, uh, their export uh, projections for, for China. This, this could mean that, uh, that China will be back in the market and, exceed, and cause our exports to actually be revised upward later. Biederman says this is a sign that China needs corn and they're not going to get it from Russia and Ukraine. He says they are concerned about meeting their needs and are shifting that demand over to our shores, calling it very positive. Avian influenza cases across the U.S. are now outpacing the 2014 to 2015 U.S. outbreak. American Farm Bureau warns it may be due to better detection and reporting protocols now. According to AFBF's market intel, there are more than 600 confirmed cases of the highly pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds, covering 31 states. There are also 158 confirmed cases in commercial and backyard flocks across 25 states. And CEOs of the four major meat packers in the U.S. will testify before the House Ag Committee later this month. As first reported by Farm Journal's Jim Wiesmeyer on Monday, the House Ag Committee invited the four meat industry leaders to discuss cattle markets and price increases on the consumer side. A panel of ranchers will also be in Washington to discuss what consolidation in the beef industry has meant for their own operations. This follows President Biden's plan to bolster competition in the meat sector that was announced earlier this year. Well, weather definitely taking a toll on crops and livestock this week. So will weather be more tame next week? We'll have a check of your weather next. Well, Matt Urasovic joining us now for weather this Easter weekend. Matt Blizzard, high winds, tornadoes, just an extreme weather week heading into Easter. But now we have some pretty chilly temperatures across much of the northern tier of the country. Yeah, that's right, Ty. And some cooler weather as we're heading through at least the first part of the week before the warmth returns. But we want to take a look at this drought monitor before we show you a look at that jet stream. And again, keeping it abnormally dry, parts of the mid-Atlantic down through parts of the Carolinas and Georgia, as well as southern Florida staying pretty dry as well. And then we've got those extreme drought conditions. Southern parts of Louisiana back into Texas, where we even see some exceptional drought conditions, even there in the panhandle of Oklahoma, down through central Texas, southern Texas as well. Staying very dry though. All the areas that we've been watching here all the way back towards the west coast and still seeing some extreme drought conditions there as well as exceptional drought conditions in parts of the Cascades. So here's a look at that root zone, pretty much mirroring uh, what that drought zone shows us with drier conditions here along the east coast. Still a little bit of uh, damp soil here in parts of upstate Pennsylvania, upstate New York, and then right down through the middle part of the country there, the Ohio Valley down into the Mississippi River Valley, middle Tennessee as well, seeing uh, some moist soil as well as parts of the Great Lakes and the upper Midwest, but then we've got the very dry soil parts of Nebraska now all the way down through Texas and back to the West Coast, excluding the northern Cascades there in Washington state. So that's a look at that root zone. And if we head through this week, a very zonal pattern, but keeping around some cooler air in the upper Great Lakes there into the mid Atlantic and Northeast as we head through Tuesday and even into Wednesday. But notice right here, a little bit of a ridge starting to build, and that is likely going to amplify as we head through the end of the week. That'll bring back in the warm the cooler or the drier weather. Meanwhile, keeping things active in the West End, potentially still in the Great Lakes as well. And you can see that really amplify as we head through Saturday and into the weekend while we start to bring in some cooler air there in the West, maybe some more active weather by next weekend. So here's a look at Monday system moving through the Great Lakes, bringing some shower activity, but staying mild out ahead of it. And another system riding around that front down towards the Southeast, bringing some more showers and even a few thunderstorms to Florida. High pressure taking control of the center of the country, but some more showers moving into the Pacific Northwest. And if we move into Wednesday, that system moving out through the center of the country, bringing some more showers right there through the middle of the country. But again, more showers and even a few thunderstorms into the Pacific Northwest. And then if we head toward Friday, very warm out ahead of another light system, bringing more showers and storms to Texas. 
and more weather back there along the west coast. Staying very warm though across the second uh, across the country really for the second half of the week. Staying above normal back in the Four Corners region with regards to temperature. Cooler where we've got precipitation center of the country and eastward as well. And then looking at precipitation heading through this week above normal northern tier and the west coast and then below normal as we head through the east coast. Tyne, back to you. Thank you, Matt. Well, the president making a trip to Iowa this week to announce summertime E15 for just this year. But what does it mean for demand? Brian Grady and Mark Gold join me next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this Easter weekend. We have Brian Grady as well as Mark Gold joining us. Brian, this big summertime E15 announcement that the president made in Iowa this week. Did the corn market have any reaction at all to that news? You know, not really, Tyne. Um, and probably not too much of a shock, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it does help out uh, E15 use. It, it'll help it a little bit. Not as much as, as some believe and not as much as some hope it would. Um, because there just aren't enough E15 pumps around the country. What we need is uh, year-round E15. This is an emergency declaration. It has to be, um, you know, reproven every 20 days, uh, and it's just for this summertime. So, uh, you know, what we need is year-round E15. Like I said, we need uh, the the gas stations to be able to invest in pumps that are pricey uh, that will allow them to sell 12 months a year. We had that with the Trump administration. It was overturned in court. And now we're to the point of, of emergency declarations, trying to get uh, the consumers a little bit cheaper price at the pump. Well, Mark, when you look at the supply and demand picture and the latest acreage report from USDA penciling in fewer corn acres, do we need to find demand at this point? Well, we don't need to find demand in any of the grains right now. We need to find a way to ration what we've got out here. Uh, the demand is there, it continues. Is it going to be as stout as some would like to hope? I don't think so. But when I look at it, we've got good margins on feeding livestock. We've got good margins just about all across the board. So I don't see that prices rationed any demand out here. And demand's going to be here. There's all this talk about the Chinese being short soybeans, and they're going to need a lot of beans between now and July. We've seen the Chinese buy have two large million metric ton sales of corn. Uh, they're not as frequent as some would like it to be, but it's a nice chunk of business. So demand is there. Uh, we don't need more demand right now, not with prices where they are. Yeah, you spoke about that Chinese demand and that big buy that USDA confirmed earlier this week. Brian, considering all of the, the trade questions that we have right now, especially with Ukraine and Russia, do you think this is just a start? Is Will China continue, do you think, to come to the U.S. to buy corn? Absolutely. Uh, China's in hoarding mode right now. They, food security is one of their top priorities, if not their top prior, priority. And you just took a, a chunk out with uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine had become the, the major supplier of corn to China. And, and I think that we will see China in for more corn. Uh, we'll probably also see China buying other commodities and what commodities they have at home, uh, especially wheat, uh, which is about half of the global supply. They aren't going to push onto the world market. They're going to keep those themselves. China's historically a hoarder. And uh, amid the inflating prices around the world, the tightening supplies, they're even hoarding more right now. Yeah, Mark, if China is indeed in hoarding mode, you mentioned corn, you already mentioned soybeans, the thought that they're going to come and buy more U.S. soybeans. Any other commodities that you think will respond uh, because China's coming in to, to try to ramp up demand? Well, I think... They could come in for the wheat market. There's been some talk about that for a while. Right now, you know, you look at some of the things that have been going on. Egypt is looking for wheat. It looks like it may come out of the Black Sea area. They'll take the risk of shipping it. Maybe German wheat. We know India's got a bumper crop, 111 million metric tons, and they intend to ramp up exports dramatically. I'm not sure that the wheat, you know, we harvest wheat somewhere around the world every month. So I'm just not sure wheat's in as dire a situation as maybe corn and soybeans are. Well, let's let's temper that by saying if you look at Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, Montana, their crops are in bad shape and not getting much better. Yeah, Brian, this week, 
Some of that crop just got worse. They had 70 mile per hour winds. Talking to farmers in the Texas panhandle, the irrigated wheat that was left, they think it's done after this week just because of that, that weather. So does that have any impact on the market? I mean, worldwide, you look at the situation with wheat. Do U.S. winter wheat supplies matter or is that already baked in? No, I, I think that some of it's baked in, uh, but as we move forward, uh, depending on what the production estimates are, as we start to get those from USDA, uh, then it becomes a market focus again, and it pushes it to the front burner again. And, and, and I think that that's important. Well, cotton futures, they have been racing higher. We need to talk about planting progress and live cattle prices do seem to be improving. Can that trend continue? We have a lot more to cover with Brian Gray and Mark Gold later on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator, it's not just any closing wheel. Reach your yield potential. Free shipping on all orders with coupon code USFR. Well, as we shared during the start of the show, the latest consumer price index shows inflation continues to increase. But what impact does that have on decision making? Here's John Phipps this Easter weekend. The jaw-dropping inflation rates of the last six months or so have turned all those amateur epidemiologists into amateur economists. It has also finally given inflation hawks their chance to say, told you so, and they did for about the last 30 years. Inflation predictions were so wrong for so long, the real thing has flummoxed us entirely. The other problem with this abrupt price change is the number of things there are to blame. The pandemic, which threatened to close down entire economies, which made a governments provide payments to avoid an outright depression, which consumers saved more than expected, which made the decline of COVID a green flag for massive pent-up spending on goods that could not be produced during the shutdowns, which became a missing the missing links in a surprisingly fragile supply chain, making many products even scarcer and harder to get to consumers because of the oil that wasn't produced and the truckers who left for better jobs. And of course, a war. Kind of makes me miss the old inflation when I was young where a bunch of oil producers simply cut back production and that alone triggered skyrocketing prices. Economists have long believed, however, that while these kind of events do create inflation, our expectations for the futures sustain inflation. If we think prices keep or will keep zooming up, our natural reaction is to buy it now at any price, making demand pressure even greater. For that matter, if that is our view on the future, better stock up on stuff we will need. So we've gone from a just in time to just in case. With this positive feedback loop in high gear, where high prices make us anticipate even higher prices, what would have to happen to break this cycle? One thing is higher interest rates to slow spending, and that looks to be certain in our future. But the historic inflation killer has been a recession. This is why you are seeing more below the fold stories about recession predictions. Now it could get really interesting. If people shift the focus of their fear from inflation to recession, the resulting behavior changes could lessen the severity of inflation and the likelihood of recession. We're struggling through unprecedented simultaneous economic and international calamities and how we weather them will depend a lot on how we think we will weather them. Thank you, John. Up next, Machinery Pete has tractor tails this week. Stay with us. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're again headed to North Central Illinois to check out a 1958 John Deere 720. This is a 58 720 diesel. It's a factory electric start. I bought this tractor in Waterloo, Wisconsin. There's probably about, I think they made around 2,100 of them all together. They were kind of a prototype for the 30 series to see if the electric start was gonna work. And if it didn't, then it wouldn't hurt the resale of the of the 30 series, 730s size wise. You know they're they're easy to get around with. Yet they have the power to 
pull the bigger loads. We plow with it, you know, we disc with them. I've even pulled planters with it. Uh, it run pretty good. We, we uh, uh, disassembled it and uh, put everything in it new that needed to be done. And then we uh, went ahead and finished the restoration with the paint and, and tires. It'll go right out to work any day. Yep. We do pull grain to, uh, to hoop all with it, to the elevator sometimes with them, with it. And we do cultivate with it sometimes. We have did uh, put oats in, a disc uh, field put oats in a couple years ago. Well, Easter weekend usually comes with sites of green and spring life. But for a large chunk of the country this year, Easter weekend is being met with signs of winter and scars of drought. The impact it's having on cattle producers next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, uh, ranchers across the West continue to battle brutal weather, but then a blizzard this week combined with some high winds as well as wildfires just added to the pain. And soon, many economists say some cattle producers will be forced to make some dire decisions. Farmers in North Dakota battled a monstrous blizzard this week. The snow is going to be a challenge, along with, I think they said something like 50 mile an hour winds. As ranchers farther south along the plains fought fires caused by extreme winds. That fire was roaring so fast, 60 to 70 mile an hour gusts that day, they said. So it, it had already covered one entire pasture by the time I got down there. Mother Nature proved to be ruthless again this week across much of the country. And for North Dakota ranchers, the Easter week blizzard was brutal, bringing as much as 30 inches of snow in spots. Well, what I have my stomach turning to knots about is the whole next week with below 30 in the low teens for the, this coming weekend too. After these calves get two foot of snow dumped on them and it's heavy, wet snow, and then it stays cold and doesn't warm up at all, it's gonna be hard to keep them healthy. It's gonna be hard to keep things alive, I think. Before the blizzard, the Langleys were busy taking older cattle to pasture with cover, with a thousand mama cows calving that were drawing the greatest concern this week. That's as ranchers across North Dakota came up with a plan to battle a blizzard that rivaled 1997. I was visiting with, some, with an older rancher um, don't kill yourself for the one calf. You got to you got to triage uh, your family and the rest of the herd are going to need you after this. So be careful out there. While the blizzard brought much needed moisture, Southwest Kansas rancher Cooper Adams is staring at the opposite. Fires this week came just five days after another fire torched acres upon acres of vital grass. Fortunately, I had some cows that got down in in a in a water hole on the river and and. Uh, and we had a right away went across there this winter that that I think shielded them some from that fire going across them. Uh, I know they the fire went by them. They didn't get behind it. Adams is fifth generation to run cattle here, a backdrop that's covered right now in dirt and ashes. I lost five, maybe six baby calves um, is the best I can tell for now and uh, about 15 miles to fences and, and then about 5,000 acres of grass. Thankful the majority of their herd survived, it's the fact the fires robbed them of already drought-stricken grazing ground that is now weighing on their minds. We were sort of in that position. We stalked conservatively, so I, I felt okay, but but losing 5,000 acres of, of grass, why, yes, I'm, I'm, I've already bought some hay and, and uh, trying to find ways that I can supplement these cattle, um, but if we don't have some rain in the forecast, I'm going to be faced with having to sell some cows. It's a tough decision and one ranchers across the West are plagued with this year. According to our reporting partners at Drovers, liquidation is already starting with the industry on track to reduce the nation's cow herd to close to 2014 levels, which was the smallest herd since 1952. And the side-by-side -side in the latest issue of Drovers paints the picture best, with nearly 80% of the nation's cattle herd seeing some level of drought and it's liquidation that's expected to continue. As we get through May into June, uh, and, you know, into July, we will see a lot of uh, ranchers forced to make some very, very painful decisions. 
as a result of the situation we're in. Oklahoma State Livestock Specialist Daryl Peel says widespread drought is the culprit for what he sees as an acceleration of liquidation today. A spring drought is absolutely a worst case scenario because we come out of winter, we've used up most if not all of our hay, we don't get any spring growth, we go immediately into severe decision making. It's not like a drought we sort of see building over a summer and uh, we can kind of plan and, and work our way into it. This one's just here all of a sudden. And he says if rain doesn't drench these drought stricken areas in the next two to three weeks, it could be a repeat of 2011. There's a couple of similarities and a couple of differences that year. Uh, the drought conditions right now uh, in terms of time of year and the potential impacts are similar to 2011. The difference is that one was, was very severe, but very localized in the Southern Plains. Now, it was a big area, but still the Southern Plains. This year, we have much wider spread drought conditions. Peel says the widespread drought will force cattle producers to make difficult decisions over the next eight to 10 weeks, something that analysts are watching closely. You know, looking at, at Q1 of next year and Q2 of next year, those prices are not encouraging any production expansion at all. In fact, you might see cowboys go out of business. Prices on the CME have not risen at the same rate as grains or other livestock markets. You, you even look in the other protein markets. So hogs have had a pretty terrific year for uh, uh, prices as well as dairy uh, and, and, and poultry. So uh, cattle's the one that sort of stands out as being a little bit out of line compared to all of the other commodities. At the same time, John Nalifka of Sterling Marketing says beef cow slaughter is racing higher. He says through the week of March 26th, year-to-date slaughter was up 16% compared to a year ago and the highest in nearly 36 years. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure in the input costs, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, so many animals head to slaughter is that herd consolidation. Another reason slaughter rates may be up is on the retail side. We see the higher retail prices sort of pulling more cattle in through the complex. It's just not really affecting that live cattle price or spot cattle prices yet. The latest consumer price index that came out this week shows consumer prices rose 8.5 percent in March, the highest since 1981. The year over year increases in grocery prices are the most telling with beef shooting up 16 percent. But the biggest surprise to Purdue University ag economist Jason Lusk was prices for food at home. Food at, at home prices increased about 10 percent relative to the same time last year. And uh, it's that's higher than we've seen in recent months, despite it being high recent months, and it's really higher than we've seen since the early 1980s, so 40 years ago. You know, interestingly, consumers are paying these higher prices. A recent survey by Purdue University asked 1,000 consumers how they were responding to food price inflation. The most common answer was, I'm just paying more. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to find more, buy more on coupons. I'm not trying to shop at different stores. So that suggests to me that a big part of what's happening here is there's just still really strong demand that's in the economy. And, and at the moment, at least, people are just uh, are sucking it up and paying the higher prices. Lusk says at some point, less disposable income will impact what consumers are willing and able to buy. It's just a matter of when. Now, the ranchers that I talked to, I did ask, what do you need? And at this point, they said, just pray for rain as they know that the next few weeks, if they don't get rain, then the dire decisions will grow even more extreme. All right, when we come back, we will talk about meat demand even more. That is with Brian Grady and Mark Gold next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Mark Gold, as well as Brian Grady rejoining us. Mark, you know, not much planting progress happened over the past weeks, according to USDA. Planting progress just slightly behind with corn, but it is still so early. So is that impacting the markets at all right now? Well, it is early, but we've also kind of lost a little bit of that early planting window we've had. You know, we like to see it get in sooner than this, if we're going to really see that happen. Uh, it's been cold and wet. It looks like it's going to continue to be cold and wet next week for much of the Midwest. So we don't really see that early planting is gonna be a factor. That tells me that the acres, are, we, we, hopefully we were gonna pick up some, some acres if they would plant early in the corn, but that doesn't look like it's gonna happen. So it looks like the corn acres will stay down and the soybean acres will stay up. And Brian, the forecast, not great over the next week, looking at some really cold temperatures in areas. At what point do traders then start paying attention to the lack of planting progress if this theme continues? 
Well, I think they have time to some degree. That's why we've seen a series of contract highs here in, in December corn futures. So the planting intentions came in well below what was expected. Uh, now you have the uh, these at least semi delays here in April. And uh, so, you know, the, the market is starting to factor in the, the potential. And then you look out in, in the Western Corn Belt and we have drought, uh, especially in the Southwestern portion of, of the Corn Belt. And, uh, you know, it, it really does bring into question whether we can get to that trend line number that, that USDA is going to put on it next month in its uh, initial WASD report for the 22-23 uh, the marketing year. Well, speaking of that drought, you know, when you look at the cotton crop really centered over that West Texas area, we mentioned the weather this week and the impact it had on wheat. Well, it is really dampening outlooks for the cotton crop this year. Is that partially what's been moving these cotton futures that have just been ferocious lately? Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, you know, USDA said that the intentions are 12 million acres roughly on, on cotton plantings. Uh, now, you know, it, they may get planted, but are they going to get harvested? I think that that's the bigger one. And, and we probably are going to see some higher abandonment rates on, on cotton than what we do in a normal year uh, if those acres do get seeded to cotton uh, to begin with. Well, continuing with that drought theme, Mark, we talked about it in the Farm Journal report, but just the herd liquidation and the thoughts if, you know, they don't see rain in the next two to three weeks, there are going to be some tough decisions that cattle producers have to make. We've seen live cattle futures trend higher uh, since that invasion of um, Ukraine really tanked prices. Do you think that live cattle futures have the fundamentals to continue to, to trend higher? I believe, you know, fundamentals, technicals, I think they're both kind of combining to give this cattle market a little bit of a chance to move higher. Um, we've had trade in the South thing five weeks in a row at 138 bucks. We tapped it a little bit yesterday uh, in Kansas at 139, which is a little bit of a good sign. We've got the futures, April futures uh, strong. We've got uh, good demand. Box beef isn't crazy. Uh, the slaughter has picked up dramatically. So a lot of those things, particularly the slaughter, is telling me that we're going to see stronger cattle prices as we move on. Now, we might see some cattle come to market early because of the weather, but that just makes it more bullish in the back months as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and, you know, Brian, you know, when you talk about demand destruction, I know Mark mentioned it when it comes to grains, and we haven't really seen it yet when it comes to grains. On the livestock side, I mean, it doesn't seem like we're seeing it either. Well, I, I think that my big concern is, record or near record retail beef prices right now. Uh, consumers are paying huge amounts of dollars at the pump right now. And when you have to spend more money to, to fuel up your vehicle, you're probably going to look for more economical cuts of, of beef. And, and so your hamburger sales are going to go up. Uh, steak sales are going to go down. And that's going to keep that, that box beef value, that cutout value from escalating too high. And uh, what we're seeing right now in the box beef market, uh, without a doubt, is that retailers are being selective buyers. They don't want to get stuck with a lot of high priced beef if the consumer isn't going to buy it. All right, Mark, Brian, thank you so much for joining us this Easter weekend. We appreciate it. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator, it's not just any closing wheel. Reach your yield potential. Free shipping on all orders with coupon code USFR. Find farm equipment on Machina Repeat's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerepeat.com. Well, conservation comes in many shapes and forms across the country. As regionally, what works in one area may not be beneficial for farmers miles away. But as we learned during Commodity Classic this year, success in conservation can pay off for years to come. As planting gets underway for more farmers across the U.S., improving production practices continues to be top of mind. So I'll take my case in Nebraska, reducing irrigation. That's a, that's a very important step because we, we can't just pump water till it's completely dry. Brandon Honeycutt farms in south central Nebraska and also serves as field to market chair for National Corn Growers Association. NCGA put out their corn sustainability report last summer and we have some very, very solid goals we're going after by 2030 to help really uh, reduce our environmental footprint. 
NCGA's environmental efficiency goals to enhance corn production sustainability includes five specific goals from increasing land use efficiency and irrigation use by 12 and 15 percent to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. More than just saying, hey, we're doing it to that point that we can go out and really show what we're doing as an American corn farmer, American soybean farmer, whatever you may be. But for Honeycutt, it's not just making changes, but showing the metrics behind practices that prove successful for farmers. Of course, we got a lot of highly rotable ground in one county, and we put that on there every year, and it helps hold the soil. It helps to take the rent, or the helps with the expenses for farmers to experiment with cover crops, and it's been very, very beneficial. The other benefit bias is seen is with weed control, something seed corn growers in Iowa have also witnessed. I think that uh, cover crops, and especially when you look at like a, a really good establishment of cereal rye in the fall, can really have an impact on weed control. Shannon Moeller is project coordinator for the Iowa Seed Corn Cover Crops Initiative. As we run into various issues with different herbicides that are being used and we see you know, different uh, resistances coming in. Uh, I think that, you know, in the long run to be able to be productive um, with corn and soy and other commodity crops. The program was started in 2016 through a grant from the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. It was estimated that about 5% of Iowa seed corn acres had cover crops on them. And now we estimate that to be over 50%. And we know just through our project alone, um, we are helping cost share on about a third of those uh, total seed corn acres in the state. While cover crop growth has been monumental in some areas, the production practice is still met with skepticism by some growers. If you're using cover crops, you change your, your whole philosophy of how you're planting and things like that. So that's, that has to be a mindset for somebody to accept, accept the change. From environmental to social impacts, even seed companies are working to uncover more solutions when it comes to conservation. So I'd say the social aspect with cover crops ultimately is that we're improving water quality. Well, when we come back, John Phipps learned the hard way that farmers and our viewers love free stuff. Customer support is next. An update on the great mug giveaway. Well, a couple weeks ago, John put out a call for those who wanted one of those highly coveted U.S. Farm Report mugs, and the response was almost overwhelming. He joins us now from the farm. Okay, I want to start today with an update on the great mug giveaway. Well, it's over. Not only did we receive far more entries than I had my wildest expectation, we ran it headlong into some, well, supply chain issues. First, all of the old red mugs are gone. There were only about 40 to begin with, and they ran out the first day after I announced the offer. I'll still try to sort through the best answers, but it's kind of an early bird situation. Second, I'm out of the new mugs as well. I buy them by the gross, but those two are gone. Third, I'm out of boxes, both doubles and singles. It takes me about 10 minutes per mug to assemble, box, tape, and address a mug. And that's when everything goes well. So when a field work window unexpectedly opened up this week, mailing slowed to a crawl. Well, a halt, actually. Finally, I had a serious discussion with my postmaster, since it takes, on average, about three minutes to weigh and label these packages. The idea of me showing up with, say, 30 would make her day very difficult, not to mention the poor dude in line behind me. Consequently, I'm mailing them out in smaller, manageable lots for both our sakes. I inadvertently loaded Tyne with extra work, too, as she manages our inbox and must separate the legitimate questions from car insurance and gutter guard offers. Thanks more than I can say for your participation. I'm still wading through the actual questions, but I will make these pronouncements. I will not be answering any gardening questions. I would get in trouble with a nearby master gardener. And I have no idea what the impact of the Ukraine war will be on food prices and availability in the future. That is a moving target. I may address this sad event later, but the best information now will come from our market experts, not me. 
Now, I had told Tyne I would answer a question this week about the farmer's share of the food dollar, which I consider a useless economic measurement, but I don't have any time left. I promise to visit that topic more fully in an upcoming show to explain my opinion. In summary, thanks a bunch for watching and for your interest. Almost everyone will be getting a new style mug, and a few of you will score the double win. Well, what John forgot to mention is I actually field those emails, and I'm a tad behind. Okay, actually really behind. So John still has not actually received all of your emails, but we promise to get those in the coming weeks. Well, your Easter meal may include ham this year, maybe some cheese, but for one dairy producer, it's the case of the stolen cheese. Next. Well, this Easter weekend, church and family gatherings are also lined with food. And in the Netherlands, cheese may be missing for one producer, as investigators in the Netherlands are actually looking into a big cheese heist. A Dutch cheese producer in the town of Finnert sharing these pictures with us, saying she woke up to find a mostly empty cheese storage room. They say overnight someone took 161 wheels of cheese weighing about 3,500 pounds total. The total value? about $23,000. The farmer says the thieves also took her trailer as well as some other things from the farm. Selling the stolen cheese in the country may be difficult as each is actually numbered. Well, that's all the time we have this Easter weekend. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend and enjoy the family time, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by